the natural law. Natural law rests on the crucial insight that to be necessarily means to be something, that is, some particular thing or entity. There is no being in the abstract. Everything that is, is some particular thing, whether it be a stone, a cat, or a tree. By empirical fact, there is more than one kind of thing in the universe. In fact, there are thousands, if not millions, of kinds of things. Each thing has its own particular set of properties or attributes, its own nature, which distinguishes it from other kinds of things. A stone, a cat, an elm tree, each has its own particular nature, which man can discover, study, and identify. Man studies the world, then, by examining entities, identifying similar kinds of things, and classifying them into categories, each with its own properties and nature. If we see a cat walking down the street, we can immediately include it into a set of things, or animals, called cats, whose nature we have already discovered and analyzed. If we can discover and learn about the natures of entities X and Y, then we can discover what happens when these two entities interact. Suppose, for example, that when a certain amount of X interacts with a given amount of Y, we get a certain quantity of another thing, Z. We can then say that the effect, Z, has been caused by the interaction of X and Y. Thus chemists may discover that when two molecules of hydrogen interact with one molecule of oxygen, the result is one molecule of a new entity, water. All these entities, hydrogen, oxygen, and water, have specific discoverable properties or natures which can be identified. We see, then, that the concepts of cause and effect are part and parcel of natural law analysis. Events in the world can be traced back to the interactions of specific entities. Since natures are given and identifiable, the interactions of the various entities will be replicable under the same conditions. The same causes will always yield the same effects. For the Aristotelian philosophers, logic was not a separate and isolated discipline, but an integral part of the natural law. Thus, the basic process of identifying entities led, in classical or Aristotelian logic, to the law of identity. A thing is and cannot be anything other than what it is. A is A. It follows, then, that an entity cannot be the negation of itself. Or, put another way, we have the law of non-contradiction. A thing cannot be both A and non-A. A is not and cannot be non-A. Finally, in our world of numerous kinds of entities, anything must be either A or it won't be. In short, it will either be A or non-A. Nothing can be both. This gives us the third well-known law of classical logic, the law of the excluded middle. Everything in the universe is either A or non-A. But if every entity in the universe if hydrogen, oxygen, stone, or cats, can be identified, classified, and its nature examined, then so too can man. Human beings must also have a specific nature with specific properties that can be studied, and from which we can obtain knowledge. Human beings are unique in the universe because they can and do study themselves as well as the world around them, and try to figure out what goals they should pursue and what means they can employ to achieve them. The concept of good, and therefore of bad, is only relevant to living entities. 
Since stones or molecules have no goals or purposes, any idea of what might be good for a molecule or stone would properly be considered bizarre. But what might be good for an elm tree or a dog makes a great deal of sense. Specifically, the good is whatever conduces to the life and the flourishing of the living entity. The bad is whatever injures such an entity's life or prosperity. Thus it is possible to develop an elm tree ethics by discovering the best conditions, soil, sunshine, climate, etc., for the growth and sustenance of elm trees, and by trying to avoid conditions deemed bad for elm trees, elm blight, excessive drought, etc., A similar set of ethical properties can be worked out for various breeds of animals. Thus, natural law sees ethics as living entity or species relative. What is good for cabbages will differ from what is good for rabbits, which in turn will differ from what is good or bad for man. The ethic for each species will differ according to their respective natures. Man is the only species which can, and indeed must, carve out an ethic for himself. Plants lack consciousness, and therefore cannot choose or act. The consciousness of animals is narrowly perceptual and lacks the conceptual, the ability to frame concepts and to act upon them. Man, in the famous Aristotelian phrase, is uniquely the rational animal, the species that uses reason to adopt values and ethical principles, and that acts to attain these ends. Man acts, that is, he adopts values and purposes and chooses the ways to achieve them. Man, therefore, in seeking goals and ways to attain them, must discover and work within the framework of the natural law, the properties of himself and of other entities, and the ways in which they may interact.